Hey, welcome back again to the Football Diary podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got another packed weekend of Premier League action to talk through, starting probably with the headline, which is the sacking of Nuno Espirito Santo as Tottenham coach, which, while not altogether surprising, is still a bit of a shock because four months in the job's not really that long to turn it around there. Uh, some amazing performances to talk through as well, none more so really than Arsenal. Fantastic away victory at Leicester 2 0 there, looking very impressive lately. Uh, and also, we've seen Brighton peg Liverpool back from 2 0 to scrape a draw at Anfield, no less. So really impressive display there. And we also have to really dwell on West Ham's charge into the top four as well. And they beat um, Aston Villa 4-1, um, which is timed perfectly with the return of the prodigal son to the podcast, Miles. Um, we're going to have to dwell on that, unfortunately, mate. But uh, right. newly married Miles, how are you, man? Congratulations again. Thank you very much, man. Yeah, really good. Uh, bit, bit of a shame to uh, come back from the honeymoon to watch Villa lose 4-1, but uh, nah, it's been wicked. I know, didn't they get the memo? Like, come on, <laughs> pull it out well, of the bag the night, for you. The night before the wedding was Villa Arsenal and my new wife's family are all massive Arsenal fans. So I had to watch that with her dad. And it was mentioned more than once, let's say, on the day in multiple speeches. So thank you, Villa, for <laughs> playing your part. Well, that is a test of your new role in the family. Hey, see how uh, how much you can keep your mouth shut after a game like that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, congratulations, mate. Really good to have you back. You. Um, I'm going to start with the Tottenham news, which is, you know, fresh today on this Monday as we record. Nuno Espirito Santo is no longer at the club. So not really surprising. It's a crazy club to be a, a manager of, wasn't it, at the start of the season? We said that. Mm. What are your thoughts on where they're at now? Oh, they're a mess, aren't they? It's it's such a weird one. Uh, you kind of summed it up in the intro with, it's not surprising, but it's also a shock. And I don't know how that's possible, but you're right. This is a manager who won manager of the month in his first month in charge, but also has a team on relegation form who somehow sit eighth. It, yeah. They're bizarre. So if we go back to the summer, Nuno was kind of set up to fail, wasn't he? He was... Yes about 19th choice and um, he was also being touted for the Crystal Palace job and the Everton job and I think that said a lot about the fact that Spurs couldn't attract someone better and that's who they were competing with when yeah. only a few years ago they were in the Champions League final so it was such a weird position to be in and then Nuno came in in the summer and he just wasn't convincing I don't look at any of the signings as particularly his sort of players he brings a very specific defensive style of football and they sign players like Brian Hill and a really attacking yeah. fullback in Emerson Real when they already had Wolves' his old fullback in that position ready. So he didn't really seem backed. He was talking throughout the summer about how he hadn't spoken to most of his players. There was Crazy. talk that the Argentinian players hated him and already fell out with him. He hadn't spoken to Harry Kane for months, it seemed, and they didn't know what was going on with that. So yeah. he was set up to fail massively. Then they went on that weird run at the start of the season where they beat Man City and they got those three 1-0 wins and they were mm. top of the league. But it didn't really reflect how they were doing. So when you actually break Spurs down, it's not surprising at all that you got the sack. I've got some stats. They, they've got the 18th... They'd be 18th in the league for the amount of goals scored. They've only scored nine goals this season. They have failed to score in four games, which is also 18th in the league. They've mm. had 103 shots. Only Norwich have had less. They've wow. uh, created less chances than anyone in the league except Norwich as well. But then their defensive performance is really poor as well. They've got the conceded the, they're sixteenth in the league for goals conceded. They've got the fourteenth xG against per game. So those stats are relegation form. I don't really understand how they're eighth. So again, it's not surprising, but it's also shocking. How is how are they not lower down the table? Yeah. I but mean, it's not surprising. The that form's not surprising at all. But I think the surprising thing that it's so soon into his tenure at the club, and we said he's got such a tough gig there, didn't we? It's unfair for anyone to be dropped into that kind of situation with the Harry Kane uh, transfer situation not resolved. Um, it was never really going to catch fire for him at any point. And I don't think he ever looked like he had a, a system or players that trusted the way he played. Kane has been anonymous, and you mentioned goal scoring stats. Nine goals in the Premier League so far is absolutely yeah. shocking. But is that because of the system that was being played, or is that because yeah. of the, the Harry Kane situation, or is it just a mixture of the two? Everything. I mean, Harry Kane's got one goal in the league so far this season, which is shocking. Yeah. If it wasn't for Son just being brilliant every, every now and again, 
Yeah. And they'd be in a much worse position. I think you can say they've actually been really fortunate. When you look at those stats and how bad their, their XG is and how bad the XG against them is as well, it's a miracle that they're eighth. So, yeah, it is soon. But actually, in terms of the contract they gave Nuna, they only gave him a two-year deal. And yeah. It wasn't the sporting director's choice. They obviously brought in their sporting director in Paratucci and, and that's clearly not the direction he wanted to go in. So they gave Nuno this short contract. So technically mm-hmm. he served a sixth of his contract and was fired. That's probably the same as David Moyes, isn't it? <laughs> when he was it's probably better than David Moyes, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> that doesn't exactly scream like confidence, does it? No, but again, what are Spurs trying to achieve? They've gone mm-hmm. from Pochettino to Mourinho, which was some mad drastic change. They tried yeah. every single coach and his dog before they settled on Nuno. Remember, they were talking with Fonseca, Gattuso. They approached Conte yeah. before, Graham Potter, Brendan jo- uh, Rogers. They've just completely run out of a plan. So to bring a manager in on a short-term contract, not really give him the kind of players that he would probably want, and to sack him four months in, what a horrible cycle to be in. And now yeah. they're turning to Conte. That's the biggest surprise of all. How, first of all, he's accepting this job. I cannot believe he's going to take the Spurs job with some of the jobs that could be available soon. You still don't know about Man United's precarious position. That could become available. Guardiola's kind of hinted that he doesn't want to be at City for too much longer. He'll see out his contract and then go. I mean, even Barcelona, there's a job to build something there. True. But he's going to take the Spurs job all of a sudden. He's already turned it down once. The talk is he's going to take an 18-month contract, which is so short. I know he's not necessarily one for a long stay at a club, but he'd want the payout at the end, surely. So, And again, yeah. you're just completely flipping styles. How, how does that make sense? Yeah. It, the more you talk about it, the more it does sound incredibly harsh on Nuno Espirito Santo to be thrust into this kind of chaos that's going on and then you know, being the fall guy for the way it's turned out when really it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. But mm-hmm. you say Conte is the main name in the frame by the sounds of it, who previously turned the, the club down for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. He's probably still thinking this is a Champions League final team from very recently. But the reality is they're so far from a Champions League final team right now. Their fall from grace has been spectacular, hasn't it? It's been so unpredictable, really. But as soon as Pochettino was gone any direction the club had was completely lost. So where the hell do they go next? I mean, the Conte appointment is so confusing because he's turned it down once before. I mean, he's got previous. He took Chelsea over when they were like 17th or something ridiculous. And he flew them up the table. He took over Juve, uh, what, nine, ten years ago when they weren't in the best position. And look what he did with them. And similar with Inter, he re-established them. So he's definitely capable. I just don't know why he'd bother with this project. It's not a Champions League final side anymore. Mm. The, a lot of the players are still there, but they're worse players than they were then. And it's not like that's because they uh, still have the potential to get better, but they're just in bad form. They've aged. They've been poorly coached. They've not lived up to the potential that a lot of those young players had. So really, the only reason Conte is taking this job is, is for money, surely. He's There's no money got good... surely, I, I, from what you gather. They what must have they got to spend? They, 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 I don't even mean what he's spending. The fact that he's taking an 18-month contract says a lot to me. 18-month contract is not, I'm going to come in and spend a lot of money in a transfer window. Because no. no club in their right mind backs someone for such a short project with the amount of money that's involved in transfer fees. So I can't see Spurs and Daniel Levy saying, right, Kante, we'll give you 300 million across the three transfer windows that you'll be here for. Never going to happen. Mm. What they might be doing is going, please just stabilise us, get us back into European football, help us keep hold of Harry Kane for a year, and we'll pay you £20 million. Who knows? That, to yeah. me, is the only reason Conte takes this job. It might be an exciting project for him with the stadium, but the squad is poor. They don't spend money. Conte loves to spend money, and Levy yeah. is notorious for not doing it. But Mourinho took the job, and we would have said the same thing about him. The good thing is, Conte could work. Yeah, I was going to say, it's an enticing prospect for both parties in some ways. And I can see how 18 months might be, let's see how it goes, you know. Mm. Because if he fixes the Spurs situation to an extent, his stock rises dramatically. And Mm. he's waiting for that right club to come along, isn't he? Let's face it. So 18 months kind of suits him. 
you can't do anything with a club like Spurs in any less than 18 months, that's for sure. It's definitely a medium-term project to get them back to where they, I guess, think they should be, which is challenging for top four. But um, but for Spurs, I just don't think it helps their cause because if he is successful mm. with them and then disappears, it says nothing about their ambition long-term, does it? And then where no. do they go from a Conte situation if he does become good? And then if it spectacularly really fails, what next? I think don't think there's any situation where Spurs come out of this positively, apart thing, from very short term. The thing is, it's a bit like I would talk about Newcastle and the fact that we're talking about all these different managers, like it's going to guarantee some sort of success because they've got money now. Conte is mm. an absolutely fantastic coach. It doesn't guarantee Tottenham success, though, because they haven't got a fantastic squad. I start thinking, what players are going to really benefit from Conte being there? Who will he get the best out of? And when you sit and think about that squad, it is bang average. What yeah. defenders has Conte got to work with there? They've signed Christian Romero, who is a good centre-back. Davinson Sanchez is a shadow of the player he was at Ajax and just hasn't lived up to his potential. They're playing with Eric Dyer as a centre-back, who's just not good enough. And Conte likes to play with a back three. Well, who are your three centre-backs at Spurs? Okay, he's got good full-backs. The full-backs will work for him. Emerson Royale yeah. and Reggion, that's a good... That's a good basis for a Conte side. And he'll play with two up top. So he'll probably play Son more central and a partnership with Kane, which we've seen work before. But yeah. then the midfield's weak. Midfield's really weak. They've got Ndombele, Hoiberg, and probably Lo Celso will be the midfield three for him. Mm. Uh, it's not It's not a Champions League midfield, really, is it? No, I don't know. I just don't think depth, don't we? They've got nothing beyond that either, really. Exactly. That, and Conte, it, he's intense. His players are going to run. That's the other thing about Spurs this season. They don't run. They've got like the 19th, the 19th in the league for distance covered all season, or might, maybe even bottom. Yeah. It's shockingly low how their average kilometers per game. But Conte will do the exact opposite. Yeah. His, his style of play is very intense. Now, if you don't have squad depth, you're in the Europa Conference League and the Premier League, and you're trying to climb the table as well. That is a hard task for those yeah. players. And a lot of those players look knackered. Because for season after season after season under Pochettino, they had a small squad and played mm -hmm. in every cup competition and went far. And how often have we talked about the fatigue of Harry Kane and his injury? Yeah. It's really sad it's, in some ways because I think at the mm. height of Pochettino's reign, where he was Champions League finalist, you know, very close to winning the title in the season, Leicester actually won it. Yeah. It just needed reinforcements and he needed yeah. to consolidate his squad after getting to the final of the Champions League while the club's stock was pretty high. They had a new mm. stadium on the horizon. You know, things were looking pretty rosy. Um, so for them to knock back Pochettino after a poor start just shows how it changed Daniel Levy's mindset to thinking, yeah, we're a big club now. Look how far they've fallen from those lofty yeah. heights. It is really well, sad because all the players that were carrying them to those heights have now aged quite considerably, like you said. So to replace them is going to cost an absolute fortune. And, and Levy must look back on that now with so much regret because what's it cost mm. him since? He's invested a load of money in players for three different managers that will be now since Pochettino yes. that haven't, not one of them has really shone or worked out. They broke the transfer record for Ndombele and we see flashes of him being good. He brought in Lo Celso for quite big money. Davinson Sanchez cost a lot of money. And also he's had to pay off managers like Mourinho and Nuno already. So that money, why didn't he just give it to Pochettino? It's bizarre. <laughs> Like, it's just such poor business sense. I can't yeah. understand why they ever thought sacking Pochettino in the first place was the right decision. And they're paying for it now. You look at any club, look at Leicester. They had a plan. Even after Ranieri left and they brought in Puel, at least it was stable. And then their yeah. plan was, let's go and get Rodgers. We've got the players that, that Rodgers can use as a foundation. You look at Man City when they were building from that sort of area. They knew. They basically hired anyone that they could to, to step towards getting Guardiola in there. They built a club yeah. for it. What are Spurs building for? If they're talking to eight candidates last time they want a manager, that says to me there's no coherent plan. No. And you're now given a squad of players who are not Conte-style players, really, other than maybe three of them, maybe mm. four if you include Hoiberg. And now we're going, right, work with that in a short window. It's stupid. I don't know what he's thinking. Okay, it begs the question then. If Conte is not the right fit for Spurs, who is? Because for me personally, I look at, we'll talk about him soon, but Graham Potter at Brighton, you mm. think they need somebody who can coach a team of 
yeah. quite lowly. Um, I don't know. Morale is very low in the squad, isn't it? The um, the feeling of wanting to play for Tottenham isn't there as much as it used to be for someone like Kane, especially. Mm. I think Potter might be the kind of manager to sort of bring that out of them. Yeah. But at the moment, Brighton look like a more likely team to finish sort of top six than than Spurs do. Oh, massive. So that's the kind of philosophy I think would help them. But what do you think? What kind of coach are they looking for next, if not Conte? I don't want to say that Conte is the wrong coach for Spurs. Conte is definitely the right coach for Spurs because he's one of the best managers in the world and Spurs will not get better than him. And he will do better with that poor group of players than most would. I think Spurs aren't the right fit for Conte more than the other way around. I just, I don't understand why he would take that job. Other than maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe he's waiting to see if Ancelotti doesn't stay at Real Madrid for that long. I can't really work out what Conte's next move is from this one. Because no. again, you kind of alienate yourself from taking many jobs in England once you're at a big team in England. It's a lot easier to step from Chelsea to Inter Milan and then go back to a Man United than it is to go from Spurs straight to Man United, for example. So yeah. I just think that's an odd move. In terms of people that would probably suit that squad better, I'm not sure there is anyone that's an obvious candidate because I just don't think it's a squad designed for a, a certain style of play. I don't think it's a squad that's built together there doesn't seem any harmony none of them are working for the manager or each other anymore they just yeah. and that's so weird because that's what you would have said about spurs two seasons ago that the reason mm-hmm. they're overperforming because they're a team right now they're not a team they're shambolic no. if I was no. with, a with a 50 foot barge pole i'd keep well away from them i'd much yeah. rather be at brighton right now than spurs it's they're shocking that used to be one of the sort of real strengths of Spurs in the past though is that they were such yeah. a great team and such a great unit and they all played for each other and that run to the Champions League final you see all that spirit come out of them didn't you and how much it meant to Pochettino he was as much a part of the club as, as some of the actual local boys you know so yeah to come from that lofty heights to where they are now is is sad um interesting fascinating really to see where they go next um this season I don't think they can hold out much hope for anything more than just consolidating a top 10 finish by the looks of it because of that middle of the table is looking very congested for sort of quality. And they're definitely within that sort of ballpark of, of quality at the moment. If they're lucky, you know, there's some teams around them that are actually doing quite well considering. So, yeah, well, difficult season ahead for them. The thing is, the squad is poor, but if they get the manager right, they're, they're somehow they're not out of it. They're only, I think they're only three points off fifth or something like ridiculous like that. I don't yeah. know how. When you look at how they're performing, I can't believe they're as high up the table as they are. But who knows? The right manager could maybe get a tune out of them. If you can get Harry Kane motivated and Son playing with him again, mm. we know how deadly that can be in the Premier League. But to me, that squad needs so much investment. And I just don't understand why you would give that investment to a manager on an 18-month contract. Yeah, big, big ask of, of anyone. And especially somebody with a, as big a name as Conte. Even then, it's it's a big ask, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but we've not even mentioned the game yet. So they beat United, uh, lost to United rather 3-0, <laughs> which we'll think on their part. Um, this United victory has given Solskjaer a bit of respite. I mean, we were considering on the pod whether he'd still be in a job in a week's time, and he is. Um, a brief note on him, if you can, because I don't want to dwell on United too much. We've given them a lot of airtime lately, but has Solskjaer got the capacity to turn around United's fortunes? Is this a false dawn? Can you read anything into a 3-0 win against this Spurs team? I, just, I don't know how many times we can talk about false dawns with Solskjaer, how often he's... Yeah. He seems like he's on his last legs and then he pulls a result out. We talk about it every time. He changed the system in this game and it worked, but I think anything would have worked against this Spurs side. There were some really encouraging things in the game. I think Varane coming back in, he was solid. He played really, really well. I think Ronaldo stepped up massively. And that's nice to see. It seems like Solskjaer's being backed, at least by the players. Ferguson obviously spoke highly of him as well. So he's still got the dressing room at least. I just I don't understand why that's not more consistent. And it says a lot about how far United have fallen, that losing to them was the thing that pushed Nuno over the edge. It was one of those games where it was just high pressure for both sides and both managers. And it was always going to be which team wants it more that was going to yeah. save a manager. And fortunately for United on the day, it seemed that they wanted it more. Playing Cavani and Ronaldo up front together was completely the right decision because Cavani is just he's such a an amazing yeah. person to watch because he just works so tirelessly. And I think it allowed Ronaldo to be Ronaldo. His goal was 
absolutely fantastic. I love that yeah. volley. Even the pass through to Cavani as he's kind of stumbling through and the touch that he took, brought the ball inside with. That's what you want to see Ronaldo yeah. doing. He needs Cavani there to, to with that kind of intelligence and that talent and that work ethic to make that work. So it was a really good result <clears throat> for United, even if Spurs are a poor side right now. I don't think it means that United are back. <laughs> no, well, there's a few, there's a few, I don't think any United fans are, are thinking that way. I think the the, the the trauma from the 5-0 defeat to Liverpool will last a lot longer in the memory than a 3-0 victory away. It's this Spurs team. So, yeah, yeah no false dawns from a United fan's point of view. Um, but I will say this: the formation change was, was much needed and probably a game too late for him. Should have done mm. this against Liverpool. The 5-3-2 yeah. or 3-5-2, whichever you want to call it, worked. Yeah. But in that system, I can't see Jadon Sancho play much of a part. That's the only thing. Which is a that's, shame. The, that's the biggest worries for Man United right now. They've now got two very talented assets that they've brought in for fairly big money that are just on the bench. And yeah. we, it looks like Van der Beek's going to leave in January. How long is Jaden Sancho going to stick around doing this? Because that, that's, that's not where he wants to be and not where he is in his career right now. And the other really worrying thing, if I was a United fan, is Conte is going to Spurs. He could catch them up. And also, it means yeah. he's not available for Man United if things go wrong with Solskjaer. And to me, he's a really good fit for United. It's a much yeah. better position. So, I, I'm i surprised that they've backed Solskjaer again, I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's got the capacity to, to take them any further than he already has, as we've talked about in this podcast several times. The problem is now the candidate list is just getting shorter and shorter. Yeah, so we'll shut the door on United, I think, for today uh, <laughs> without repeating the same old things that we say every podcast, it feels yeah. like. And we'll move on to a resurgent Arsenal team who beat Leicester on uh, home turf at uh, the King Power Stadium 2-0. A really strong away win for them. They're looking like they're in some form at the minute, aren't they? And I know they've scored both their goals within, what, the first 20 minutes of the game and pretty much held firm for the rest of it. But it was yeah. still an impressive performance and not one we've seen from Arsenal from the start of the season, especially, is it? Mm. They've turned a corner massively over the last few weeks. They've been fantastic in many ways. They've got a level of intensity back to their football that just seemed to be lacking at the start of the season. Aubameyang's yeah. woken up and is is leading from the front again. Lacazette's uh, chiming in as well. So they've got some attacking power. But mainly the defence just looks so much more organised. Yeah. And who would have thought that Aaron Ramsdale was going to be the centrepiece of a, a brilliant Arsenal do, uh, all of yeah. a sudden? He was fantastic in this game. His attitude and his philosophy really is what the club needed. He G's them up, he, he gets them going, and he's he's someone who has a presence in that goal. It makes you wonder what Arsenal could have been last season if they'd made the correct goalkeeping choice last summer as well. Because yeah. as much as we might credit Leno as a, a good shot stopper, he's not, he's not got any personality to him. He's not a commanding player. He's not someone who's going to organise the defence very well. He's going to do his job and his job alone. Whereas Ramsdale seems to be the one that's going to give the character to the whole side. So really yeah. well organised. And it looks like now they've got a fully fit 11 and Arteta is kind of a bit more aware of who he wants to play, things are clicking for them, which is, yeah. which is really good news for Arsenal, to be fair to them. That's the point, isn't it? The 11 is an Arteta 11 now. It feels like this is the system, this is the philosophy he wanted to play. The centre-back pairing, Gabriel and, and Ben White, seem to look really positive. And they're still quite young, you know? So it looks like a future investment there. On the wings, they've got Smith Rowe playing in the form of his life uh, and Saka as well. So it looks like a very clear identity, which I've not associated with Arsenal for three, four years, maybe more now, you know? So looks positive. For Arsenal, definitely. Um, they're now level on points with United, I think, uh, in that sort yeah. of fifth, sixth position. So they've climbed that. the league pretty impressively. And, and what a turnaround they've had in comparison to, to Tottenham, you know. Yeah. Um, North London completely flipped on its head. But Leicester, do you read much into their defeat? Um, I, to be honest, I'm surprised Leicester aren't just shattered at the moment. Because it feels like that Leicester are playing football every day with the European True. competitions as well. Um and obviously the Carabao Cup. And I know Arsenal were in that too, but um, no, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It was a fantastic performance from a goalkeeper that kind of kept Leicester out. I think he made uh, like eight key saves, including that wonderful yeah. one from Madison's free kick. So on another day, you probably put a couple of those chances away. They'll be frustrated to be conceding from a set piece in particular. Um, 
But no, again, Leicester. I don't really know what to expect of Leicester this season. I don't. I'm not. I'm still not 100 percent sure what their level is at. They don't look like they're going to be competing for top four, which they have for the mm. last couple of seasons. So it's still taking some time for them to really find their feet. But the quality that they've got in that squad and how well Rodgers has done with them, they'll be fine. They'll they'll be in the, the sort of conversation for the top eight come the end of the season, yeah. regardless of results like this, I think. Well, there's still the uh, same issue as Arsenal had, really, that their starting eleven hasn't been their actual first choice for a long, long time. Yeah. So injuries have taken the toll, haven't they? And I think yeah. Wesley Fofana is probably one player they can't wait to get back Massive to full fitness because uh, he was key for them, really, wasn't he? Yeah, uh, but we've seen a lot of, of Pat Sandaka lately as well. He scored a few yeah. goals in important times. So I think in terms of a long-term Vardy replacement, they're probably looking to him, which he looks, looks like a, a nice addition, another scouting win for, for the Leicester team. So Definitely. yeah, there's positives there. I don't think there's any need to worry. They've just not kept up with the rest of the top four teams, have they? It's been uh, yeah. tough to do, to be fair, because they've all signed fairly astute players this, this summer. Mm. So, yeah, difficult to to stay with that chasing pack when you've lost some key, key players from the start of the season. But yeah. nothing to worry about, you don't think? No, like you say, it's expected. I think you can allow for, for those sort of things. For Fani, you're right, is such a huge miss. Yeah. Particularly as Soyuncu hasn't really been himself in a lot of the games. He's starting to look a bit more solid again now, a bit more consistency in the last few games. And Johnny Evans being back is such a big deal. But yeah. for Fana, absolutely fantastic footballer and a, another one of those signings that you just think how did Leicester pull that off so when he's back that'll add a lot more stability I think and also just worth noting though the one thing that would worry me if I was a Leicester fan is if they don't make Champions League this season which it looks pretty likely they won't how are they holding on to Tielemans any longer because yeah. he is absolutely phenomenal I love watching him play football. I wasn't on the pod last week, so I didn't get to mention his goal. But again, he's just... Oh, he's, I love watching him play. He's brilliant. Such a good midfielder. And there's, they seem to be uh, pretty lacking these days, a midfielder of his kind of capabilities and all-rounded sort of gameplay. So, yeah, yeah, another... That would be my one concern as a Leicester fan, how they hold on to him. Yeah, I agree. I think he's at the age and in the kind of form that's being noticed, I think. And a lot of teams need a midfield player like him. Um, you know, he could fill a lot of gaps in a lot of big teams. Yeah. So they'd be lucky to hold on to him, I think, beyond the summer, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but that goal was actually um, kind of reminded me when um, Brighton played Liverpool, which we'll talk about next, when Mwepu scored their first goal. So they went 2-0 down to Liverpool and brought it back to 2 all. And Mwepu's goal looked very much like a sort of Tielemans-esque finish. I don't know if you saw much of it, but it was a really, really, really kind of jamming, but also really impressive looking shot. Uh, but what do you make of Brighton? They're, I think, seventh now in the league. They mm. haven't won the last five games, but they've always looked like a threat. And against the Liverpool team in this kind of form, to bring it back from 2-0 down away from home was a statement to me. I think that's a really impressive performance. Yeah, I think with Brighton, they last season they showed a lot of promise but weren't getting results. And this season they seem to be a bit more efficient. They They didn't have a particularly successful transfer window, in my opinion. I think no. they really could have done with bringing in a big striker. There was a lot of talk of him being linked with Tammy Abraham at one point, but realistically, that was never going to happen. But Potter is a good coach, and he's clearly got the best out of the players that he already had there. So nice to see them kind of up the table where they probably belonged last season. It's yeah. it's interesting to know what the target for Brighton is. I think they probably just want to establish themselves in the mid-table section and not be battling against relegation at first and continue to build. That goal was lovely. I do wonder how much of it Alisson saw. It looped up so high and the sun was just straight in his face. I think he, he lost it a little bit. Oh, no, don't take it away from the guy. Nah, I mean, what, nah. a, what, a, what a statement goal Listen, that would be for him. You know me. The last thing I want to do is come up with excuses for Liverpool. They do enough <laughs> of that on their own. So it was a lovely goal. I'm very, very glad it went in. And it, great for them to get the result because yeah. Liverpool have been on <clears throat> incredible form lately. They tore Man United apart last week and we've seen them do that to Watford the week before. So it would have been yeah. a, a nervous task for Brighton. And then you go 2-0 down. So to hold on to something, to have the spirit to get back into the game, it's fantastic. It shows what this Brighton team are all about, really, the tenacity of it. And the football yeah. for Trussard's goal was lovely. Really good passing yeah. moves. And it was nice to see them get the reward that they probably deserved. Yeah, I don't think that coming back from 2-0 down was like a fluke by any chance. You know, like you no. said, the Trossard goal was so well made. 
And you can just tell, like with many teams, you, you can tell they've not been coached. But with them, you can tell they've been very, very well coached. So, yeah, fair play to Brighton for that. Although um, I'm a little bit angry at them. Because, okay. of course, when I'm debating who I'm going to make the captain of the fantasy <laughs> team between, do I make it Ronaldo, Salah, or for some reason, I just I really fancied Reese James this week because Newcastle are rubbish. <laughs> And I thought, no, come on, everyone's going to pick Salah. Don't fall behind, and Salah will obviously score. Brighton managed to stop him from scoring. Brilliant. So, thanks for that. And yeah, another reason why I don't play fantasy football. Thank you for reminding <laughs> me. Uh, but no, I think Brighton with a team that contains like Solly March, Adam Lalana, and Trossard as well. All talented players, but I think they're they're kind of overperforming a little bit the way they've been playing lately, and that's down to coaching. So yeah, really can't praise Graham Potter highly enough. And yeah. what a player Basuma is, by the way. You talk about midfielders on the radar. I think he's definitely another one that's like on a lot of people's radars. Well, there was massive talk of him leaving in the summer, wasn't there? And yeah. Tottenham, United, Liverpool and Arsenal were all linked. And then there was a big issue off the field, supposedly, that I don't really know how it's been resolved yet. So he's back in the team now after having a bit of a time on the sidelines. So it'll be interesting to see how vital he is for Brighton and whether they hold on to him come January even. Because if teams are looking for a solid midfielder to shore up their European campaign, someone who's not going to be cup tied or anything, absolutely, it'll be a hard one for Brighton to hold on to. Yeah, I think so. Um, speaking of teams that are kind of punching above their weight and pushing the top end of the table, we're going to move on to West Ham next. And I know it's not something you particularly want to delve into because a 4-1 defeat for Villa at the hands of West Ham um, looks like a dominant performance, but the red card pretty much changed everything, didn't it? Was yeah. it a red card, do you think, in your opinion? Um, was he the last man? What's your take on it? Because, I mean, they weren't a million miles away. They were competing, weren't they? West Ham were in control, but Villa, up until that point, was still in the game. Yeah, I mean, it was one all. And to be honest, I, I think it's a really soft red card, but I can't have too many complaints because in the same move... Courtney mm. Howes could have been sent off as well. So, Absolutely. and that one probably was more likely a red card of the two. So it was quite surprising to me to see Conster be the one that went. Um, That's another yeah. one of those ones that went to VAR as well and inexplicably got yeah. let get let past because it was yeah fine you know fair play. I thought that looked yeah. like dangerous conduct to me, but uh, what do I know? They literally checked them both at the same time as yeah. well. That's what I couldn't understand. They looked at that one and were like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. But then Dean Concerts, who there is, there's contact there. But I just, I don't know. It's a soft red card, if we're honest. The ball wasn't um, going towards goal, in my opinion. It was, no. it was going away from goal. Um, to say it was a clear goal scoring opportunity is, is pretty, uh, you know, that's not, an obvious thing for me to say when I see that in yeah. slow motion or even in real time. So to go to VAR, consider both of those decisions, just deem the Courtney House challenge not a red, but then mm. deem that the following move to be a denying a clear goal scoring opportunity for me is just mm. inexplicable. And I can see why Dean Smith is really annoyed with both of those situations. I think he'd have taken a red card for Courtney House, wouldn't he, instead of the game going on? Because he'd have probably fancied his chances more with 10 men at that point than going another goal down. It was so bizarre, really, like the events of, of the game and what Dean Smith even set up for. The reason he's angry right now is because he's feeling the pressure, you can tell, which is a shame. Mm. I love Dean Smith. I've said it on this podcast several times how much I would back him. I'd let him be at Villa for as long as he could possibly be. I think he's doing a great job. He got this game really, really wrong. He panicked a little bit. The results have been on the slide and he tried to address it by dropping Minks which I thought was a really odd decision. Very strange, yeah. Moving to a 4-3-3 as well. And I've said for a while I want to see how we can play with wingers. So I'm not angry that he did that. But I just thought it was a, it was just such an odd decision to do for this game in particular. And the personnel changes just didn't really make sense. The mm. problem that he's got right now is he's just not worked out what his midfield is. And he's just, they're not strong enough in midfield. If you're going to play with a midfield three, that he's got to sort that out really quickly. Because Jacob Ramsey, although he got a lovely goal against Arsenal, he's, he's not good enough right now to, to kind of lead that midfield in the way that he's expected to. I just feel like since, I hate bringing it up and I try and avoid it at all costs, but since we lost Grealish, I don't think Smith has worked out what his Aston Villa team looks like anymore. No. 
He's tried a couple of systems. He's got an idea of what he would like to play. But I'm not sure he's got the personnel for it. And that's going to be really problematic. Four losses in a row in the league with three points off the bottom three and in 16th place all of a sudden. This is a Villa side that I think a lot of players, a lot of people, even after they lost Grealish, would have probably said they'll be pushing for a European place this season. Yeah. They brought Danny Ings in, they brought Leon Bailey in, they brought Brendan Deere in, some good business done, but it's just not clicking. And that's worrying. Mm. When you look at the players and you think that's not clicking and I'm not sure why, we lost two assistant coaches in the process as well. It, it doesn't look good for Smith and Friday is massive. Play Southampton on Friday who are struggling mm. too. They've got a bit more form of the last few games, which is a really frustrating time for Dean Smith to meet them. If he doesn't win that game or if Villa lose that game, there could be real, real problems. I hope the Villa board just keep the faith, keep trusting in him, view the project the way that they have the whole time and just yeah. give him that little bit longer to just stabilise the new players, get a system in place. I, I desperately think we need a better centre midfielder in, in January. Just yeah. yeah, I agree. I think you need to cut him a, a bit of slack, really, Dean Smith, because a player as dependent as they were on someone like Jack Grealish to kind of change a system to suit life without him, I think is a big ask. And it's almost like, not probably on the same scale, but losing a big dynasty manager and then trying to build a team around a new manager, you know, the way of playing is completely changed. And I think yeah. everything went through Jack Grealish. And if you look at Man City's play now, everything is going through Jack Grealish. He's mm. still got the most chances created out of that whole Man City front line. So mm. they're as dependent on him because of what he brings to the team, what he does with the ball in that final third as Villa were. So, you know, you've got to say to Dean Smith, you know, to try and find a way of playing that's not including Jack Grealish anymore mm. uh, with new personnel is a big ask. So I think it's a matter of time. I don't think it's time to press the panic button, that's for sure. To, to consider him on in the sack race is, is ridiculous, to be honest. I think even if Villa went down, they should probably still take Dean yeah. Smith with them, you know? I mean, we, we won't go down. There's three teams worse than us in the league. We will not go down. Like, I'm not worried about that at all. Um, yeah. If we started to look like we were going down, then the board would make that decision because they just can't afford another season in the championship. It's no. not worth it. We would it would set us so far back. But I'm, I'm not. Even, I don't even want to have that conversation. It's not going to happen. On the flip side of it, though, West Ham, brilliant. Like, where has this come from? All of us, this West Ham side that were just they were a bit of a joke, weren't they? They moved the stadium and they were just being mocked by everyone for it. The fans hate yeah. it. Their owners are just absolute clowns and just making public fools of themselves on a regular basis. David Moyes looked like a ghost managing them and just had no idea how to deal with his squad. He went off sick and their results improved. And it was just like, oh, West Ham, what a, what a turnaround. All of a sudden, the fans are buzzing. They've got a really exciting squad of players that are actually really likeable. Declan Rice is one of the best midfielders in the league right now. David Definitely. Moyes is coaching them incredibly well and has got them set up brilliantly. And now they're looking like they're going to compete for the European place again. Definitely, and yeah. I thought last season was a bit of a fluke, to be honest. So fair play to them. They're playing really yeah. good football. They're exciting to watch. They're really likeable. So, yeah, a great turnaround for, for West Ham too. I think that the spine of their team, not even the spine of their team, but the majority of their starting eleven writes itself. And that is the difference, I think, for most teams in like a mid-table Premier League team with ambitions. You know, if you've got a team with Fabianski, Zuma, who's slotted in really well, Ogbana, Suchek, Rice, Bowen, who's been playing great, Fornals, Ben Rama, and then obviously we've not even mentioned Antonio at the spearhead of that. Those names will get into a lot of teams. Um, and oh. to see them click, um, it's quite a nice thing to watch. And you say uh, Declan Rice is kind of the the poster boy for this new West Ham, isn't he? He looks mm. so impressive. Can they hold on to him? You're right when you say that they would get into a lot of teams, but even six months ago, they probably wouldn't have. I actually think they're really overperforming. They brought Ben Rama and Bowen from championship sides that, and they've just both completely shone. Antonio was yeah. a right back when they signed in. And all of a sudden, he's, he's West Ham's all-time top Premier League goal scorer. Still and sounds crazy to say that. Yeah. No one had Suchek on their radar when they brought him in. 
he's just come out of nowhere. Declan Rice is now being talked about very highly. Zuma couldn't stay at Chelsea. Agbonna left Juventus. All of these players weren't necessarily favourable players, but West Ham are turning them into brilliant footballers again. It's, David Moyes is doing a fantastic job there and deserves all the credit he can get. He probably deserves a move yeah. to a big club, probably someone like Man United, if Solskjaer doesn't work out. <laughs> don't, don't, mate, honestly. Yeah, I think he'd have uh, only just finished a six-year contract that he had like maybe last season or something. I think that was how long his contract was due for. But you're right. He should be turning heads of a few other teams. And I think the job he's done there is superb. But David Moyes is the kind of manager that thrives on consistency, having his style stamped all over the team. Yeah. And West Ham have given him time. They've been patient yeah. with him to build a team that is in well, his image, as Everton this did. This time they have. This time they have. Uh, but they were chasing ambitions that were a bit misguided before because they had like Pellegrini in charge for a while. They were signing players like Yarmolenko and Sebastian Allaire, who although obviously is a fantastic player, Champions League top scorer, wasn't a West Ham player, you know, it didn't suit any kind of identity. But every player they've got since then, although they were a fairly unknown quantity for the, the time, look at them now, you know, they're slotted into a, a very recognisable system. And they're a good team to watch. I enjoy watching yeah, West Ham. Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, I think credit where it's due, you know. West Ham have probably got ambitions to finish in Europe this season, and rightly so. I think that will be, if they can hold on to the players they've got, their ambition for the foreseeable, which is a uh, stark contrast to some other more established teams at the minute, like Tottenham that we've been talking about. So, mm. and to be a West Ham fan at the minute, it must be quite interesting. Uh, anything else from the, the weekend stand out for you, Miles? Have you seen much football with your uh, crazy week of married life? <laughs> yeah, to be honest, catching highlights on the honeymoon was uh, was pretty difficult. But no, I think uh, Claudio Ranieri's uh, time at Watford's been uh, interesting so far. I think it'd be yeah. interesting. Obviously getting the result against Everton, but then Southampton as well. It's it's going to be a mixed bag for him, isn't it? But uh, no, I think this, this weekend, nothing overly interesting. Oh, other than Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace beating Man City away from home all of a sudden was a fantastic result for them. Great performance. And pretty well deserved. I think the red card was pretty harsh. But again, Crystal Palace, I really did not expect much from them this season. And Vieira is doing a fantastic job there too. So a bit of credit there. And Chelsea just for some reason decided that for the first half, only Hakem Ziyech was allowed to shoot. And as soon as everyone else shoot, they were going <laughs> to score some goals. That was the only other thing I noticed this weekend. I would just say the um, start of the season, obviously, we made our predictions and you actually put um, somebody, a certain Crystal Palace as, as a relegation candidate. So, you know, amazing turnaround for them. What's, right. what's been the difference, do you reckon? Well, Vieira has done a much better job than I thought he would. Uh, Conor Gallagher is absolutely fantastic and somehow yeah. Christian Benteke has become a really effective footballer again. I will amazing. say I also called Salah as top scorer while you lot were too dreamy-eyed at Lukaku again and Chelsea are still <laughs> top of the league so don't get on me too much well that's the nature of making predictions like this isn't it we can all have a good laugh at some point but hey we're what 10 games into the season mate so don't count your chickens just yet. Yet. Villa uh, anyway I've got no more to talk about in the Premier League so far what I want to ask you is when are we going to be talking about Serie A again Hopefully soon, you know, it's uh, been a busy time, but there's been some interesting stuff in Syria. Uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic scoring free kicks at 40 years old. AC wow. Milan Napoli still unbeaten in the league so far this season, which is really impressive. Juventus still falling behind and dropping points where they really shouldn't. So it's been an interesting time in Syria, as it always is. And we might be seeing Mourinho go a bit Mourinho every now and again, which is, again, always entertaining. <laughs> It feels like it's always on the verge of that, though, doesn't it, with him? And uh, teams will never learn. Teams will never learn. It's crazy. Um, right, yeah, anyway, that's it for today's pod. If you like what you see, please do give us a sub on YouTube. If you're listening to this on Spotify, yes, we're on Spotify now. Please follow us there as well if you want to hear us on the go. Even a like on this particular video would be nice just to keep uh, the channel growing. Uh, but, yeah, in the meantime, though, thank you, Miles. Uh, great to see your, your face back on the screen. Enjoy married life and I'll see you next time, hopefully, mate. Thanks, man. See, see you later. later.